Good afternoon and welcome to the NRCOP webinar on regulatory capability. What does it mean and how do we acquire it? Um, acknowledgement of First Peoples. We have participants from different parts of the world at this webinar, so I would like to begin by acknowledging all First Peoples here today and pay my respects to them and to their forebears. We honour your wisdom and your stewardship of traditional lands and seas and your customs, which enrich us all. I'm Lorraine Cherney, manager at the NRCOP and honorary research fellow at the School of Political Science and International Studies at UQ. On behalf of ANZOG and the NRCOP, I'm delighted to welcome you to our fourth webinar for 2021. It's now my privilege to introduce the two other panelists. Our first panelist is Dr. Grant Pink. Grant is the academic advisor to the NRCOP founder of Recap Consultants, a specialist regulatory consultancy firm, and has more than 25 years regulatory and enforcement experience. Grant's PhD examined how regulators build and maintain and sustain regulatory capability and capacity. So Grant is well placed to speak to us today. Welcome Grant. Our second panelist is Victoria Thompson. Victoria is the Deputy Director General of Liquor, Gaming and Fair Trading in Queensland and is responsible for the regulatory policy and strategic direction of product safety, licensing, compliance and enforcement activities. Victoria has held senior management positions in high risk industries such as construction, electrical, transport and agriculture and is an active and valued member of the Queensland chapter of the NRCOP. Welcome Victoria. So how today's session will work. It will run something like this. Grant will start with an overview on regulatory capability, exploring what it is and techniques on how to achieve it. Victoria will then provide insights using a case study from the casino regulation sector, after which I will present a short piece on some work that we have been doing here at the NRCOP on regulatory training and professional development. We will then open it up to you, our audience, to ask some questions. Well, welcome everyone and good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever and whatever time is, wherever you're joining us from. Thank you very much, Lorraine, for that introduction and for the ANZOG NRCOP for the opportunity to speak to you on this issue of regulatory capability. Regulatory capability is a topic which was ever present in my career as a practitioner, as a manager and as an executive in regulatory and enforcement agencies. Um, perhaps never more so than probably one of my last jobs when I was in government and I was the director of a regulatory capability and support section which variously assisted 24 sections, 15 branches, eight divisions and three deputy secretaries building capacity in over 18 pieces of legislation and I think one of the important factors of this was that um, over half of those pieces of legislation had international agreements attached to them for which Australia was a signatory. And as Lorraine flagged, it was also a topic which was relevant to my PhD and earlier research around environmental enforcement networks and communities of practice. And the latter research was about how regulatory enforcement and policing agencies come together when they were combating transnational environmental crime. And uh, because you're here and because you voted for it, it's also a core topic in its own right that is discussed nearly every time we meet as an ANZOG NR COP advisory board. It is quite ubiquitous in that in that sense. Um, and, and finally, I suppose as a, as a regulatory consultant and coach, it comes up. It comes up all the time whether you know it's a local government, state government, territory government, federal regulator, or even some of the international people. So um, you know, while it's obvious, I think it's really important that we spend the time to speak about regulatory capability. So how are we going to do this? Um, I think what I'd like to do is just walk around the issue tell you what I've learned by considering this issue over 25 years as a practitioner, manager and, and consultant. Um, I think from all of those perspectives, there's one thing in common, and that was that the aim of advancing regulatory capability was always about the practitioner. It was always about making sure they were better placed, better equipped to engage in regulatory implementation, regulatory practice or regulatory delivery, however it was described. Now, because of this diversity, um, audiences obviously from time to time have divergent views. So uh, when I typically approach it or have a discussion around it, I like to use the five W's 
and 1H, or some of you will know that as the six loyal servants. So that's the who, the what, the where, the why, and the how. So I'll use that framework of six component parts to discuss regulatory capability at a high level overview with you. And I'm hoping that that high level overview will place us well, firstly, for the case study that Victoria will present shortly into in finer detail, but then also as we move to the question and answer in the next stage. So firstly, in terms of the who, um, you know, who should the regulatory capability be directed towards? You know, is it an individual? And is that individual moving from a non-regulatory role to their first regulatory role? Is that regulatory individual moving from a generalist compliance position to a specialist one in enforcement or litigation perhaps? Is it a team who provides some specific regulatory function? And I suppose interestingly with COVID, you know, the method and manner in which that team is currently delivering their regulatory activities, that might change. It could change for legal, procedural, technical, scientific, any number of reasons. And as the live example is, even moving from doing things in person to remotely is what we're currently facing. Or does the regulatory capability actually relate to an agency? And it's an agency that's undergoing significant change. You know, are they enduring, suffering, um, going through a once in a generation experience, moving from a licensing regime to one of a general duty model perhaps? Or are they going through a once in a um, uh, election cycle, machineries of government, and they're actually inheriting some new regulatory responsibilities and the sector, the industry and the commodity is perhaps somewhat foreign to them. Or, as is often the case, is it at a portfolio level where several agencies actually share and overlap regulatory responsibilities? And that can be critically important. So I also see agencies struggle with the what. You know, for me, when considering regulatory capability, the what is critical. You must land the what. You need to know what you are building capability for. Um, and what I also see is agencies conflating capability and capacity. So as a result, for example, when there's a real or perceived lack of capability, they will recruit, resource and increase the capacity. Sometimes that works, but also it can actually be putting a bandaid over a much bigger issue um, and actually further exacerbate what was the initial or perceived lack of capability. So on that, my advice to regulators is to think about their core purpose, specifically think about the nature and scope of the legislation that you're administering. Think about the harms. Think about the risks and think about the impacts that you're, you're seeking to control or at least mitigate. And also think about the industry sectors and commodities that you intersect with. And be really clear, be absolutely laser clear about the regulatory outcomes you're seeking to deliver. As we move to the where, regulatory capability can really be focused anywhere across the extended regulatory spectrum. Um, I think from time to time, regulators will shift their focus and direct capability efforts um, to certain component parts. And I think we quite often see regulatory regime design at the left of the spectrum will receive additional attention when regulatory burdens or reducing red tape is a hot button issue. Also, depending on the, the current state of a regulatory pendulum where that's currently sitting, we also see regulators spending a bit of time building capability around advice and guidance if education and engagement is required. Equally, they might move to enforcement if they're wanting to increase caseloads prosecutions and penalties. And finally, to give you an ex uh, example from the other end of the spectrum, regulatory performance and evaluation. That comes into sharp focus when annual reviews are due, when there's an ombudsman, ombudsman's inquiry or some sort of independent inquiry. I think in terms of the when, um, simply put, agencies are overwhelmed with the reactive work and they very rarely get the time to prioritise and move towards the proactive. So as a result, invariably, these regulatory capability efforts usually occur just in time. And as the title suggests, that capacity is built on the run and it's just in time for them to actually deploy and use it to best they can. Um, but I would submit that regulatory capability like regulation and the regulatory cycle itself, um, it should be considered in terms of the short, medium and longer term. So short term, what do we need this week? What do we need this month? What do we need this quarter? How are we going to deliver on our tactical regulatory activities? As we move to the medium term, what do we need for the next six to 12 months as we chunk that up and we consider operational activities for that quarter? And in the longer term, we should be looking at a three to five year horizon and updating that annually as to where we should be focusing our regulatory capability. Now, the why, um, why, do we need, why do we need to re 
you know, increase our regulatory capability. This is driven by different and sometimes perverse reasons, but generally speaking, agencies will want to build their regulatory capability, become more self-sufficient. And that's because their budgets are reducing or changing as to sometimes other relationships with co and peer regulators. Those co and peer regulators priorities change. So the regulator who leads that piece of legislation and administers it needs to be doing more completely themselves. So simply put, if regulators don't have the capability, then they can't do their job at all or they risk of, they risk doing it suboptimally. So it's a really, really important issue. Um, and of course, vitally the fact that you're here um, under the ANZOG NR COP, uh, regulatory agencies are really passionate about increasing the regulatory profession in, in its own right. They equally want to increase regulatory professionalism. So this is where this is a really, really important topic. But when you do it, please consider the co-design, the co-development and the co-delivery with learning and development specialists and educators. They play a really, really important role. As we move to the how, I think, um, you know, building regulatory capability can be approached in a number of ways. Um, those listed on the screen are the typical ways. Um, they can be done individually, they can be grouped, or they can be treated as a collective. Now, for this presentation, I have deliberately paired them, and I've paired them because training and continued professional development are often used interchangeably. However, when considering regulatory capability, it really is worth remembering that training is about acquiring the operational process and procedure aspects of a job to perform that function and hopefully in order to perform it at a competent level. Whereas continuing professional development or CPD is more about an ongoing process of developing, maintaining and documenting your professional skills. So that's enabling you to acquire skills and knowledge which are then transferable or enable you to do more nuanced complex work. As we consider networks and community of practice, these are both vehicles and mechanisms that bring regulatory practitioners, managers and executives together to share their experience, to share their lessons learned. Now, that's irrespective of where that regulatory agency sits in terms of its own regulatory maturity or its current regulatory posture. So networks uh, by their nature tend to focus more on the generic and transferable aspects of building regulatory capability. So quite often you'll see networks focusing on training, policies and procedures as being typical topics. Whereas communities of practice, they're more specific, they're more organic, they tend to come from, from the ground up. Um, and of course, to be a true community of practice, they need to have the three component parts, which is a focused domain, an actual community and a focus on practice. Finally, as we move to joint regulatory activities and twinning projects or staff exchanges, they then go to the next level of fidelity, a real, real sharp focus. Um, so in terms of these joint regulatory activities, historically, they've been about joint audits, joint inspections, or in the enforcement space, they've been about task forces and you know joined up litigation, if you like. But it really is the twinning projects and staff exchanges which enable staff to really deeply experience the lessons um, in real time. I think those those of you familiar with training, um, developing training models will be familiar with the 70 20 10 model for learning. And you'll actually note that I've actually deliberately reversed my order to 10 20 70. And that's because this tends to be the order in which regulatory agencies approach uh, regulatory capability building. So that is 10 percent occurs as formal learning. Now that's through training and CPD that I've mentioned above 20 percent occurs through developmental relationships, typically those acquired through networks and communities of practice. And the 70% of gaining experience comes through those challenge or stretch assignments that staff will be given and possibly through twinning projects and staff exchanges. I think in terms of sort of stepping back and thinking what we want to achieve, I just give you this, this simple formula to perhaps consider. Um, mentioned earlier that capability and capacity are terms that are often conflated. So capability here is more about the organisational attributes. So the regulatory infrastructure, the legislation, the mandate, the authorising environment, many of you will use that term, the regulatory powers and the regulatory posture in order to respond. And capacity refers to, refers to the resources, so that is the people, the equipment and the budget to respond. And if both capability and capacity exist, we should start to see some form of regulatory competence. Just as an aside, in relation to competence in many European countries, 
and under inter international agreements, the term competent authority is the actual term used in legislation to describe that lead response agency. If we continue and we add consistency to competence, we can then tend to see a level of regulatory credibility. Um, just a quick word of caution on consistency. Uh, consistency should not be pursued or considered in absolute or extreme terms because regulation enforcement is not formulaic. Far from it. Instead, regulators should be able to demonstrate their transparency and accountability by documenting any necessary deviation from the norm to what might be perceived as acting inconsistently. Finally, when credibility is combined with competence, we start to see signs of regulatory culture. Now, I wouldn't be true to my pracademic responsibilities and role with ANZOG if I didn't offer you a little bit of additional information, uh, and that information goes towards the academic. For those interested, I've chosen three books, which, which I have and are much loved and thumbed through, uh, because they all make a significant contribution to what I consider to be regulatory capability. Firstly, Professor Sparrow, in relation to the problem solving approach, uh, the six stage problem solving approach that Malcolm unpacks in his book, the character of harms aligns well with the who, what, where, when, why and how that we've just run through. And like the book's title, the reality is that all regulators are trying to address harms, unravel knots and respond to operational challenges. And these challenges are increasingly involving conscious opponents who are operating in a fluid and fast changing environments. Secondly, Professor Coglanese, in terms of agency culture, he talks about and considers and articulates traits, actions and outcomes, or TAU as it's referred to in the book. Now these provide a really useful concept to triangulate a regular's activities. And in line with the book's title, hopefully consideration of TAU will help regulators to advance if not achieve regulatory excellence. Finally, Professor Chris Hodges and Ruth Steinholtz in, uh, in their book talk about reciprocal cultures and they really highlight the importance of regulators to look inwards as much as outwards and work with regulated entities in a mature way and fundamentally recognise that ethical behaviour is a two way street. So their book highlights the importance and benefits of regulatory agencies having an open culture, a questioning culture and a learning culture. Finally, my key takeaways. Um, simply be clear about the regulatory issues that capability seeks to advance. And to help you gain clarity in what capability you might or should be seeking to build, you should consider the benefits of outcomes based, risk based and problem solving approaches. You need to take a system wide and holistic view of capability and to achieve that system wide and holistic approach, think wider rather than narrower. Use the extended regulatory spectrum as a framework and equally look to the regulatory stewardship model developed in New Zealand to achieve tangible long term and sustainable regulatory capability. Be collective and inclusive in terms of designing, developing, delivering capability. And to achieve that collaborative and inclusive environment, you need to be conscious of incorporating all relevant views, both dominant and divergent, and being sensitive to the viewpoints of co and peer regulators. Thank you for your attention. Back to you, Lorraine. Thanks very much for that, Grant. Um, now we'll pass over to Victoria Thompson, Deputy Director General from Liquor, Gaming and Fair Trading in Queensland. So in August 2019, the Independent Liquor and Gaming Authority of New South Wales established an inquiry under the Casino Control Act of 1992, primarily to examine whether Crown Sydney was a suitable person to give effect to the Barangaroo Restricted Gaming Licence. Um, the inquiry's commissioner, Justice Patricia Bergen, found that Crown was not suitable. Um, and a position that was agreed by the independent authority who have now commenced a consultation process with Crown about the actions that they need to take to be deemed suitable to open the casino. Overall, Commissioner Berg had found that Crown in relation to the Victorian operations had enabled money laundering, had partnered with junket operators linked to organised crime and had disregarded the welfare of their China based staff. Of particular interest to this forum though, is the lesser known part B of the inquiry's terms of reference, in that the commissioner was asked specifically to also look at the efficacy of the objectives of the act that was under um, scrutiny, to assess the authority's ability to respond to um, current and emerging risks, to make recommendations to enhance the authority's future capability, having regards to the changing operating environment, and to also take a cue from domestic and international best practice for gaming operation and regulatory frameworks. 
So the Bergen Macquarie, um, as it's been become popularly known as, um, it's just been described by many superlatives, scorching, forensic, um, revealing, um, and it is indeed all of those things. Um, but fortuitously, it also provides us today with a contemporary case study to examine this issue about regulatory capability. And clearly, these are my own views and, and not part of the Queensland government's. But I think it's relevant nonetheless to just turn our minds to how what Grant was talking about before all fits within the context of something that's really hitting the hot pages of the media here in Australia at the moment. So let me start by painting a picture of how Crown operated as per the Commission's findings. So front and centre was the ubiquitous, um, powerful and political presence of James Packer. The executives and the board members, many of which you see on your screen now, um, were briefed him and provided information in the absence of direct reporting lines um, or even the right to that information. Poor corporate governance was evident, including regular withholding of information from the board, its directors and the risk management committee. There were conflicts or potential conflicts of interest that were not identified or managed and their risk management um, procedures were found to be quite deficient. There was an absence of understanding amongst the board about anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism funding legislation and landscape. Um, this is obviously a particularly significant risk uh, for casino operators. The international sales program to attract junkets to their premises was highly aggressive. Um, and indeed was one of the few matters that the board was actually well briefed about. There was a failure to act on ongoing media allegations about junket operators, money laundering and staff treatment. And there was a failure to act on concerns raised by their own banks about potential money laundering. The commissioner was quite annoyed at their failure to appropriately respond to the summons and indeed to disclose critical information to the inquiry. And all in all, Commissioner Bergen um, found that Crown's complacency in respect of the evidence of from pretty serious risks was indicative of a very confident culture and one that had failed to look inwardly. So although they're a familiar um, fixture on our landscape these days, and it's hard to believe that New South Wales and Victoria were indeed the final states to open legal casinos only in the mid 1990s. And uh, Commissioner Bergen noted that the regulatory landscape in New South Wales, much like Sydney itself, um, for those of us of the 1980s vintage, we'll know what Ken Doan's all about, um, much like New South Wales had changed very much indeed. The original uh, Casino Control Act of New South Wales was highly prescriptive. Fast forward 28 years and the current regulatory framework is much different. And here on the slide, I've outlined some of the, I guess, the key differences between the two regulatory models. And many commentators are suggesting that really the Crown inquiry is as much a story about what is going on inside Crown as it is about the gradual degradation of the casino regulatory inquiry, where you're moving from a prescriptive to risk-based model, from a independent casino regulator to a more generalist gaming clubs and liquor type of inspectorate um, where you're changing the control from the regulator to allowing more control to the operator. Many changes to this environment were due to a, a review that was done in 2016, the Casino Modernisation Review, uh, which recommended a risk-based co-regulatory model. And the justification um, for this, at least in part, and many of us who you know, are interested in regulatory theory would find this quite familiar, was that casinos are, they're large, they're well-structured organisations who would be motivated to comply with their corporate reputation and um, make sure that wasn't in tatters, and also, most importantly, to protect their licence to operate. Commissioner Bergen, however, called those underpinning assumptions naive, and she clearly formed a view that the current regulatory design is deficient in terms of its fit with not only Crown's culture, but the complexity of the casino environment. She preferred the testimony of Professor I. Nelson Rose, who said it was a major flaw to treat casinos like any other industry. 
And he argued that Braithwaite's pyramid may well work in a society where shaming is important, but not in a morally suspect industry that was not so long ago illegal. So I think it would be fair to say that uh, uh, Commissioner Bergen formed a fairly strong view that the regulator currently doesn't have the cap capability to effectively discharge its functions or to respond to existing or emerging risks. And to be capable and effective, she came up with a three prong model for casino regulators. And that is to be independent, to be specialist and to be powerful. The headline recommendation of the Bergen inquiry is to establish through separate legislation a dedicated standalone regulator that is um, funded through an industry levy that will have the standing uh, powers of a Royal Commission, that the act that they administer should really be all encompassing, i.e. that should have an objective of ensuring that casinos prevent um, money laundering, uh, which is different from the current arrangements and that licensing decisions and disciplinary actions must not be subjected to fetter from government um, interference. She also argues that basically the regulator shouldn't be distracted by other concerns, for example, liquor licensing, um, and that its workforce needs to be highly specialist and expert in casinos and their risks. So the capabilities that she's looking for is uh, casino licensing, anti-money laundering, uh, compliance monitoring within a casino environment and surveillance and investigation. So she talks about creating a highly credentialed and experienced workforce, but at the same time, she also cautions against the risk of hiring from ex-casino staff due to industry capture um, risk there too. So whilst the New South Wales government is yet to formally respond to the Bergen Requiry, um, I think that what it does point out is that clearly, you know, from the regulatory environment, it's very complex on many levels. Uh, the recommendations obviously are extensive and they warrant some further analysis um, research. And my job here is not to uh, critique Justice Bergen. I think I would point out that, you know, all regulatory approaches have inherent, inherent shortcomings um, and risks. And apparent to me, um, in terms of Commissioner Bergen's recommendations are issues about the risks of regulatory capture, both from an inspectorate point of view, and she also raises the prospect of external auditors. Um, and for us regulators who've worked with external auditors before, you know, we know the risks of them just becoming basically employees of the companies that they are working for. I think the other issue that I think about is workforce sustainability. Um, and finding those people with those really specialist skills on an ongoing basis, and then being actually able to move your workforce and change its skills base in response to emerging risks and harms, as Grant said before. Moving money laundering into the Gaming Regulators Act also for me raises issues about role clarity, clarity um, and the risk of potentially things falling between the cracks if multiple regulators are responsible for the same or very similar objectives. And I think there is also a big question about, you know, the willingness of governments to seek control um, over entities such as casinos to commissions on a full time basis. Having said all that and whether we agree with the recommendations or not, I think the case study does broaden our thinking about how we design, develop and deliver regulatory capability. As I said before, the notion of prescriptive versus risk based was a critical factor um, that was examined by the inquiry. And clearly this fundamental threshold regulatory question informs decisions about the types and the mix of skills that we typically talk about, the technical, the audit, the investigation, the advisory, um, engagement or enforcement. But what is evident through this case study, I think, is that in order to design a best fit regulatory approach, capable regulators start with a deep understanding of the regulators' cultures and systems, its incentives, its perversities, the leadership, beliefs and attitudes, and importantly, their power and their influence. Now, this is not new to us regulators. It's a conversation that we often uh, have and noticeably um, in the wake of Royal Commissions, think uh, banking and the financial services sector. 
But I think moving forward, the new regulatory capabilities that will start to are starting to emerge and I think will just continue to grow around data and analytics, uh, collective problem definition and problem solving, marketplace intelligence, behavioural science and the ability to engage with boards and talk their language about governance are emerging, as I said before, and will only grow, I think, in terms of their importance to regulatory capability. Regulators also need to understand that in the event of regulatory failure, what types of remedial action or enforcement will motivate the entity and act as an efficient deterrent uh, to others within the regulated environment? And importantly, regulators actually need to be empowered to use those tools. My understanding of the Crown uh, licence is that the licence could only be amended with the agreement of the casino operator. And we all know that licensing and conditioning are such a critical part of a regulator's armoury. Uh, to inhibit their application would seem to be quite disabling to regulatory capability. The case study also highlights point two there on my slide, which is about the authorising environment. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's really about those who are in our environment who give us legitimacy and support, um, either formally or informally, uh, to do our jobs and the direction that our job should take, the, the public value and the outcomes that we should seek to um, uh, achieve. And sometimes the regulatory environment is invisible and sometimes it's not so visible. And it can be a very, very crowded space. Uh, obviously, clearly here within the Crown, you know, you had some very big, bold personalities. They're not in everybody's space, but as regulators, typically the one that is, is government. And Bergen, through this case study, she calls out the tensions that exist between the various outcomes that a government need to deliver. In the casino environment, for example, operations need to be conducted with integrity and to be free from criminality, but they also employ a lot of people and they generate significant revenue that provides essential services for communities. Crises often lay bare tensions and they force governments to rebalance their priorities and their objectives. And in a post-COVID world, economic recovery, we know and we're already starting to see, is going to be a priority of Commonwealth and state level governments alike. And I find it interesting that, you know, here we are, barely is the ink dry on the swim back to prescription recommendations of the Bergen report, that I'm also reading news reports of the federal government's establishment of a regulatory leadership cohort to drive cultural change as part of their effort to speed up COVID recovery, that is to identify and reduce regulatory burden and red tape. So these are contested environments. They're constantly shifting and changing in response to external stimuli. But understanding and being able to influence the authorising environment, I believe, are also essential regulatory um, capabilities. A capable regulator gets legitimacy and support from the authorising environment by understanding the complexities and the tensions that are within it, by being very clear on their purpose, to be frank about the policy gaps and the risks that they're encountering as regulators, to be regularly reporting on performance and what they're achieving in terms of the outcomes that are being sought, to check that those outcomes and the objectives remain current and ensuring the regulatory system's ongoing fitness for purpose. So all of that regulatory steward stuff, stuff that um, Grant talked about before. And again, I think fundamental to um, being capable in that space, clearly excellent organisational leadership at all levels is necessary. But I, and our valuation, which you know we as regulators have been, I guess, struggling with for some time and getting better at that, but I think there's still a way to go. And I think the other one that we really need to pay attention to if we're going to improve our capability in this space is the relationship in our own organisations between our strategic arms, our policy arms and our operational functions. So the people who are over the top looking out over the balcony, um, the people who are in the policy space and drafting legislation and regulations and those people who are out in the ground um, and getting the, you know, the feedback all day every day about understanding the systems that are being regulated. 
Over and above all that, I think that critical to regulatory capability is also building relationships with the authorising environment whilst maintaining independence, obviously, and acting with integrity. Um, reputation matters to capability and trust enables us as regulators um, to collaborate with others, to take a few risks and do things innovatively and differently so that when things do go wrong, as they inevitably will, um, that we can take out a few social capital deposits, out, uh, withdrawals out of our bank. And my final takeaway from the Crown uh, case study is the importance of peer and co-regulator responsibilities and relationships. So here is a very stripped back um, and simple diagram showing you the interface of the different regulatory systems within the casino environment. Um, the, I sit in the gaming regulator space and so one of our core functions is to make sure that the people that we are licensing are suitable um, in the gaming industry. We have Austrack um, who are obviously overseeing um, things like compliance programs that casinos, pubs and clubs have in place for things like suspect transactions. You've got the police who are in there, you know, enforcing criminal law, um, outdoor um, motorcycle gangs, um, drug money, all that sort of stuff that might be laundered through um, gaming. And then you have ASEC as the national corporate regulator. Now, in the Bergen inquiry, the relationship that became most under scrutiny was the one between gaming regulators and Austrac. Um, and it certainly appears that Austrac's concerns about suspicious transactions in Crown Melbourne for, for various reasons um, were not shared with the gaming regulator. And Commissioner Bergen says the gaming regulator was you know, effectively kept in the dark and she had the view that that was due to um, an ever present attribute of turf protection, unquote. Now, as practitioners, we know sometimes it's not that simple. Um, we are routinely frustrated by confidentiality provisions which prevent us from sharing information and intelligence. Um, I think as innovation, disruptive technologies and resource disparity uh, means that as regulators, this will only um, exacerbate some of our issues and that we will be constantly trying to keep up with those that we regulate. I think it's impossible if we go it alone. And already this inquiry has facilitated conversations across the um, forearms that you see there on your screen and even within the gaming regulator space itself. We, these conversations are obviously very welcomed and sharing and peer support and talking to one another um, is essential. But to lift capability, that commitment to collaboration and partnering must move beyond this immediate crisis um, to actually be embedded as part of our normal culture, our systems and our structures. We need to subscribe, I think, as regulators to an ethos that regulatory capability is not just how capable we are, but also how we can collaborate to enhance other regulators' capabilities. So what's next? Well, there's Crown Series 2 and 3 uh, to look forward to. In Victoria, they've also announced a Royal Commission, um, which will also look at suitability of Crown Melbourne to hold its Victorian licence. Um, and parallel to that will be an independent review, looking as to whether they need to establish an independent casino regulator uh, down in Victoria. And that will provide advice on you know, structural and governance arrangements um, within the state of Victoria. That's to report by the 1st of August. There is also going to be a Royal Commission in Western Australia and to Crown Perth. That too will look at suitability of licence, but also look at regulatory framework matters as such as um, Patricia Bergen examined. So, you know, the adequacy of the existing framework um, whether it's up to its task, whether it's up to the risks um, and any enhancements that need to be done, including policy and ledge, um, administration or structural reforms. That is due to report by middle of the year, by the 30th of June. So both commissions have very ambitious timeframes to get this piece of work done. I'd encourage you, obviously, as re regulatory practitioners to stay tuned 
for series two and three of the crown i'm sure they'll continue to be a lot more searing uh, revelations as well as insights for regulatory capability more broadly as a cohort of regulatory practitioners and professionals we need to strive to stay contemporary and positively critical of our own regulatory capability. ANZOG and events like today provide us the time and the space to engage with our peers. I thank you for taking the time from your busy agendas to focus on yourself and your own capability and to add to our collective capability as regulators. Thanks, Tony. I'm just going to very quickly talk about um, some research that the NRCOP did um, towards the end of last year, um, where we asked our members back in October to tell us about the training um, in terms of regu regulation and professional development that they had um, experienced in the last three years. Um, I've just got a very, very quick slide, which I'm going to um, to show very, very quickly. Um, all, all the slides from today will be online for you afterwards. Um, we asked our, um, our members if they'd had training over the last three years, what it looked like, um, who provided it and so on. And then we asked them to consider training in terms of their current position and future um, promotion prospects. And then we asked them to consider whether um, work the any future training should be based on workplace specific training skills or on more broad based transferable regulatory skills. And there was most definitely um, a preference for broad based transferable regulatory skills. When we then asked um, our members to identify um, where this training and the um, topics um, this is the, the hit list that we got. Um, and you may actually see your own training needs or that of your organisation reflected in these results. And as you can see, they are very broad. I'm going to not spend any more time on this slide because I would like to get us to the, um, I would like to get us to the um, Q&A session. Um, because you have been very, very busy on Slido. I'll just stop sharing this and um, OK, so the first question um, is first to Grant and then to Victoria and um, is asking, um, can you comment on the costs of not building regulatory capacity amongst the workforce and what are the risks here? Grant, if you would like to start. OK, thank you. Um, I suppose what it makes me think of that that quote or that meme <clears throat> where it's the conversation between the uh, CEO and the chief operating officer and the uh, the chief operating of or sorry the CEO says you know what if we um, <clears throat> what if we train them and they leave and the counterpoint is what if we don't train them and they stay so I think as regulators we have to be thinking about what is predictable what is our responsibility what are our regulatory obligations that we need to be investing in that's that's the front end the back end is imagine your worst nightmare if it is predictable and you end up before Senate estimates or some board of inquiry and you have to defend why you didn't build some capability. So that would be my my uh, brief comments. So um, I, I thinking about the cost, I just take a slightly different view. Um, regulatory failure and as I pointed out, you know, we're seeing the Bergen inquiry We've seen um, regulation in aged care facilities and banking. All of these take a hit, I think, in terms of collective trust in regulators. And obviously, you know, as, as regulators, we want to build trust in regulators because that's how we get people to work with us and to also comply um, and, and to partner and to enable uh, partnerships with us. So I think obviously regulatory failure and not investing in regulatory capability uh, takes a dent on confidence and public confidence in regulators. I think the other thing to think about too is the people that work within regulatory agencies, in my experience, are highly committed, highly skilled. They want to come to work with that, well, they do come to work with a really strong sense of purpose and commitment um, to add public value and to get those safety outcomes or those market efficiency outcomes or environmental outcomes, whatever outcomes that is that they want to seek. 
Um, and if without the capability to setting people up to actually succeed, um, then we really risk disenfranchising um, people within our organisations. And what we instead want to do is to enable their achievement and to enable them to deliver on their purpose. Thank you. Um, the next question is, um, do you see more value in peer to peer regulatory training or formal training to attain qualifications? And Grant, would you like to go first, please? I think, uh, you know, both have their place. Uh, in fact, some regulatory agencies have mandated minimum uh, requirements where formal training is required before people can be authorised officers or inspectors or investigators or whatever they're called. So clearly, the formal qualifications have a place. I'm also a fan of the formal qualifications in the extent that we are here as Anzog talking about um, advancing a regulatory profession. It's hard to say you are in a profession or you are a professional without some underpinning formal qualifications. <clears throat> that said, uh, there is also a place for peer-to-peer -peer learning. I think the speed at which regulation is changing, the nature that regulatory enforcement and policing agencies are working together increasingly across what is lawful, what is um, lawful but egregious and what is criminal means we can't all be doing formal training to the, the level required at all times. So there is a place for peer-to-peer. -peer. So for me, um, it's a balance. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think it's, uh, I agree with Grant. I'd like to have a bet, bet each way on this one as well. Um, I think the, the formal uh, training um, certainly adds a lot of credentialization to the industry and professionalism to us as regulators. Um, having been the beneficiary of ANZOG programs, I think it also, you know, forces you to to go through a whole structured process and you meet a lot of people as part of the formal learning environment as well who end up, certainly as a, my experience through ANZOG anyway, you know, they become your peers and they become your sounding board. Um, I think the, the peer to peer, sometimes we may be um, think too narrowly about who our peers are. Um, and as I said before, just with the recent conversations that we're now having um, as an outcome of Bergen, um, expanding our, our peer network. Um, but I've also seen that happen um, where we have peer to peer, but not necessarily regulated to regulator in things like the transport industry um, and bringing in people who were not regulators, but to work with regulators um, has been highly successful. So that's definitely gone its benefit as well. And I think particularly in that space, it's very uh, contemporary. As Grant said, that kind of just in time kind of learning, if there's a hot issue or a crisis, uh, it can be particularly effective. Uh, we have a question here um, which says, um, should there be one regulatory capability framework for all regulators? Now, I will start by saying that um, following the survey that we did of our regulatory practitioners back in October, um, we at the NRCOP also did some extra work on this and we conducted an environmental scan on the training that was currently available to regulators. And we looked at the type of training, the modules covered in the course format and structure, mode of delivery, service provider and so on. And there's the, the take home message here is that this is a very complex and messy area and there's a lot of rabbit holes in which you can go down. So I will flag with you that the environmental scan and report is available on our website and um, you're more than welcome to access this. So Victoria or Grant, would either of you like to add anything else to this in relation to whether there should be a should be one regulatory capability framework for all regulators. Grant, I can go first if you like. Yes, please do. Um, I don't have an issue with having one regulatory um, capability framework, but I do think, um, as I highlighted before, and I'll, I'll quote an ex-Prime Minister, um, you know, as regulators, in and of ourselves, we are a broad church. Um, whilst you know we have people who do the inspection and the compliance monitoring work and the investigators and the you know advice and the engagement officers, um, there's diversity within there. But I also think that we need to think more about the people within the regulatory agency who are involved in regulatory strategy. Um, some of that sort of analytics um, capability around cultural capacity, um, and also to to involve the policy, um, I think is really important. So happy to have a single framework, 
but it does have to provide for the broad church of people who sit within regulatory functions. And perhaps what it could do is to better thread some of it together, um, because at the moment it seems that uh, we're not as cohesive um, as we need to be in terms of managing our operating environment, enhancing our regulatory capability by having those many layers of the regulator uh, working efficiently together and how they all can benefit one another. From my perspective, picking up on that broad church comment from Victoria, um, if we could have a single system, we already would have had it because there's a lot of people doing a lot of thinking in this space. So my comment would be, um, there are some core generic components that all regulators should have around, you know, reading, interpreting, legislation, being familiar with your powers, et cetera, et cetera. But then there's the next mid-level, which is more industry sector and commodity specific. And then you get to the super specialist level where it's legal, policy, technical, scientific. So um, again, I think, um, back to my comments in the presentation proper is crowd the thinking in, really think about the capability that you need to deliver on your core work and what is predictable coming over the horizon. But um, yeah, simply put, I think um, if it was possible, we'd have one by now or we'd have a pretty strong draft. Okay, um, Victoria, perhaps you might go first with this question. Um, what should be addressed first, culture or capability? I think, well, I think the two of them are so intertwined. Um, culture in terms of your own organisation, I think, you know, as an organisational leader, culture is something that it's what you pay attention to as well. So, you know, I guess as you start to build capability and to focus on areas within your organisation where, you know, you want to increase your regulatory impact, um, the skills that you want your people to have, the diversity of people that you recruit into your organisation to build that capability, I think that that then has a cultural impact um, and managing the culture and getting to the culture that, you know, that I guess that as a leader you're aiming for, it, it's not a, you know, you flick a switch and, you know, therefore you have the culture. It really is about having a plan and building on that regulatory capability will have cultural impact. Um, through the organisation, there's no doubt about that. So for me, the two things are almost like it, you don't have to choose. That's the good news. Um, it is complex and it takes time. Um, and as regulators, we just need to continue to, I guess, pay attention, which is what we're all about today, to this issue of regulatory capability um, and taking that diversity piece, thinking broadly about what capability means. And I think internally that will build um, the cultural base um, that your, you know, your regulatory uh, delivery um, is based on. And, and I think pretty much along the same lines, my, my brief uh, comment on that would be that, <clears throat> as I've said, be very clear about the regulatory outcomes you are trying to achieve. And if you can be clear about those outcomes and the associated risks, harms and impacts you're trying to manage, and you're clear about the authorising environment, which Victoria laid out in her presentation, and you have a clear regulatory posture, I think it will become more obvious what your capability requirements are. So they interanimate to a large extent. So I'd, I'd find it difficult to unpack them like Victoria. But uh, if you're clear on your outcomes, you're clear on your operating environment in, and you're clear on um, you know, your posture, I think what you need in terms of capability and capacity will become clearer. Yeah, so, sorry, Grant, can I just kind of add to that? I think, yeah, this sort of the cultural issue is always quite, you know, a bit um, amorphous and difficult. But at, at the end of the day, it really is about um, the things that you do and that you pay attention to and, and how you go about your business. Um, and capability is obviously a critical part of that.